Okay. So I'll stop. Yep. Sounds great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so thanks so much, Clara, for setting this up and continuing to advertise it. So as mentioned, I'm a postdoc here. I've been here before, but I just arrived um, first at Columbia in January and then at GIFs. Um, working with Costas here and with Lorenzo Falvani and APAM. I'll be presenting w work I did on aerosol indirect effects. And this was work, this was basically my PhD um, defense presentation, which I defended at the University of Oslo in December. Um, this was originally a 20 minute presentation. So I figured I could do a couple minutes of background here. As mentioned, I worked at GIS. You can still hear me, right? I might just yep. every minute ask. Yes, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> just to be sure I don't disappear and keep talking. Um, so yeah, originally this was a 20-minute presentation. Um, so I thought I could say that I worked at GIS actually seven, eight years ago. So it was a while. It was right when uh, Jim Hansen retired and Gavin took the reins. Um, and there, I, at that time, I was, I just had gotten out of my bachelor's degree and, and was doing like post bachelor work, technical aerosol related tasks with Costas and Susanna. Then in 2014, I went to graduate school. I started, I had something of an unconventional route. I started off at Yale. Um, and then I ultimately transferred to the University of Oslo um, at both places working with Trude Sterelvmo. Um, so at, essentially at Yale, about a year after I got there, they decided they no longer really wanted to fund climate research on planets named Earth. Um, and most people left. A, a comical number of obstacles were put in my way of getting things done. I had to constantly reinvent projects, um, always requiring two with different supervisors at a time. So I was initially working on dust climate modeling, um, but they didn't like climate models. So I tried doing dust research with LES and mesoscale models. I also did some wind energy research some climate economic modeling. Most of these things didn't lead too far. That wasn't working. So ultimately, I tra transferred to Oslo, rejoined my PhD supervisor, Trude, who had already relocated there um, at the University of Oslo. There's a lot of climate activity, a lot of people who contribute to the IPCC. And then suddenly, my research went smoothly. And I was able to focus on one project, which is what I'll show you today, um, in addition to a little bit of research on cloud feedbacks as well. So then I defended with a slightly smaller version of this presentation um, this past December. You can still hear me, right? Yep. Great. Um, and then after defending, I was hired at Columbia by Lorenzo Polvani and APAM, um, intending that we'd unite my interests in clouds and aerosols with some of his, including atmospheric circulation, and a few weeks later, maybe the start of February, um, I got a message from Lorenzo that he wanted to talk to discuss um, some uh, changes in my job <laughs> position uh, and being, ex being uh, subject to external factors to such a degree the last years. In my mind, he was already uh, I thought Lorenzo might be moving to Iowa or something, relocating his group. But actually, he had been talking to Costas, and they wanted to do some volcano, volcanic forcing research, and they thought I could do this. So my position was switched to being in the GIS APAM co-op, and now I work jointly with Lorenzo and with Costas. And I'm overjoyed to be back here, where I started out in a way, um, and always remember the very supportive work environment here. And I really look forward to continuing to interact with you and to meet more of you folks. So let me get to the presentation. Um, so this is essentially in three parts. The first is an introduction, clouds, aerosols, and climate, which of course many of you know about, but I'll gradually tailor it down 
to the foci of the remaining parts. Um, the bulk of the research I'll be presenting is on to what extent natural and anthropogenic aerosols can warm a cool Earth's climate by acting through cirrus and mixed phase clouds. And then at the end, uh, I have several slides on uh, a geoengineering project I took part in where we looked at if we could deliberately seed uh, cirrus clouds with aerosols, if this could counteract global warming significantly, just through modeling. So you can still hear me, right? Yep, you're good. Okay, good, good. Um, so far, so good. Um, so clouds, uh, I'll be discussing a vast range of scales, especially how processes can you see my pointer, by the way, just out of curiosity? You can, right? Yes, I can see that. Yeah. So also on the right, you have uh, nano, micro, and millimeter scale processes that impact cloud formation and, and their radiative effects and then have a global uh, impact, right? And it's really this range of scales that makes uh, cloud research uh, of this sort so interesting and so difficult. Um, so in particular, we're interested in cloud radiative effects here. So how they reflect shortwave radiation, which especially happens for clouds that are thick or have a large density of droplets or ice crystals. Um, we're also interested in cloud long wave effects. So how clouds can warm by absorbing outgoing radiation from Earth. And this happens especially in, in high clouds, which tend to be colder and less emissive. And then, of course, clouds are also a key component of the water cycle, but I won't really be talking about this except a little bit of precipitation at the end. So you get both the short wave and the long wave effects that uh, impact uh, energy fluxes. And then these cancels give you a net forcing. Um, which so so globally, you get a, a substantial negative forcing um, that, uh, for, for the sake of this presentation as such, uh, I'll, I'll be talking about warming and cooling, but really I mean positive and negative forcing. So so clouds certainly cool um, the earth. There are a number of ways of classifying, dividing up clouds. Um, for the purpose here, um, there's stratiform clouds that are more horizontally developed and deep convective clouds that are more vertically developed. And I'm, I'm telling you this distinction because I'm really only going to be t talking about stratiform clouds here. That's what we did in the modeling experiments is, is we adjusted those. And uh, in particular, I'll be talking about clouds below the freezing point um, at mixed phase temperatures between minus 38 or and zero degrees Celsius, where either liquid or ice can exist, and then cirrus, which is sufficiently cold that only ice uh, can be what they're composed of. So aerosols now. Sorry, I wonder. My apologies. So aerosols um, also impact radiation. Like clouds, there's both shortwave and longwave effects. Um, this can be direct absorption and radiation, but then there's also that when you, the presence of aerosols impacts the radiative effects of the clouds. And in particular here, I'll be discussing indirect effects, which is how aerosols have a role in microphysical uh, formation of cloud droplets and ice crystals as compared to semi-direct effects, how um, the presence of aerosols heats the atmosphere, prevents clouds from forming, also uh, changes cloud formation through stability changes. Um, and like I mentioned, I'll be talking about radiative forcing specifically. This is what I calculated, we calculated uh, in most of these experiments. Of course, these have impacts on surface air temperature at once the atmosphere readjusts toward equilibrium 
Um, and in particular, I'll be what I'll be presenting are effective radiative forcing. So include fast feedbacks in this case, uh, impacts of aerosol on cloud lifetime. So why do we care about aerosol forcings? Well, one of the chief reasons is that we need to understand aerosol forcings to be able to know the impact of greenhouse gases, in particular, because aerosols are generally cooling, they mask over the warming of part of the warming effect of greenhouse gases. Um, as you can see here in this diagram uh, from this mirror study, um, the aerosol forcing range is represented here with 90% confidence. And then for a, a more negative aerosol forcing that that given what we've observed, we can expect uh, that greenhouse gas, that's carbon dioxide, is causing, would cause, be causing more warming. Um, you can still hear me, right? Oh, thank God. Um, and uh, we also, it, of course, it's important to understand the aerosols in their own right, pollution control, if we, uh, disallow certain types of aerosol, then what's the impact on, on radiation and temperature? Um, and then geoengineering, I mentioned I'll be discussing later. So aerosol indirect effects are typically uh, divided up between more warm cloud effects, where the presence of aerosols, they act as cloud condensation nuclei, CCN, um, and help water vapor be converted into droplets. Um, but I'll be focusing here on the role of aerosols and ice crystal formation. And this can happen uh, either transitioning from water vapor or water droplets into ice crystals. And I'll get more specific uh, going into mixed phase and cirrus clouds. Um, and then these microphysical transitions will have impacts going between uh, different aerosol states there will be impacts on the cloud albedo, reflectivity, and also lifetime. And these are poorly constrained and especially poorly constrained for INPs. There's a lot of observational gaps here and just the scale, um, the scale difference between nano, uh, et cetera, and global is, is, is quite difficult to overcome. So if we want to know how changing levels of aerosols acting as ice nucleating particles, as I described, which are INPs, if we want to know how these whether these will cause warming or cooling and how much, first of all, we need to understand a bit what's going on on the microscopic scale, um, where these foster phase transitions. Um, and then we need to understand what's happening to the cloud's optical uh, properties. Generally, where we have more droplets um they have stronger shortwave and long wave properties and when there's fewer uh, weaker and then also because the elements for a con for a relatively constant mass um the droplets and ice crystals would be larger and fall out quicker so shorter lifetime effect so these are quite linked to each other and then we have to ascertain the forcings um uh, or, or what we're really interested in is warming or cooling. And this will depend on the initial state of the cloud, whether the clouds are warming or cooling initially, right? If we're um, strengthening or weakening uh, their impacts, right? So we need to also understand uh, the long wave effects in addition to short wave. Um, so now I'm going to introduce uh, what's going on in Cirrus a bit um, through the IMP effect. So, so there's essentially two processes at work here. Um, when you add INPs, you get water vapor that is depleted on, onto these and forms ice crystals, um, or at least that's the old fashioned belief of what's happening. Really, we expect that in the surfaces of INPs, such as dust, there are little pores that can have liquid at, at serious temperatures. Um, it won't freeze there um, initially until, yeah, and, and until you reach the right, um, the right temperature. 
and then you'll get the formation of a new ice crystal. Um, but there's another process where you have liquid aerosol, such as sulfate, um, liquid solution, um, and those can those can freeze directly um, without the aid of a solid aerosol. And when you enable heterogeneous nucleation to happen by adding INPs, you actually wind up taking in the water vapor that's necessary um, to reach the satur high saturations needed for homogeneous Earth's nucleation. So these end up being two competing processes and adding INPs, you don't immediately know whether you're going to wind up thickening or thinning the clouds. Um, and I, I should just emphasize um, again um, that where there's generally where for a given amount of, of, of water mass, uh, more small elements rather than fewer large elements, we being here um, ice crystals, um, the more small elements make, makes an optically thicker and more radiatively impactful cloud. Um, so, so cirrus overall have a strong and dominant long wave effect. So they generally warm. So if we're adding INPs um, to cirrus that are initially formed by the heterogeneous nucleation on the INPs, then we wind up thickening them, which we expect will result in warming. But if instead we're adding INPs to cirrus that are already formed through homogeneous freezing, we're going to reduce the saturation and disable the homogeneous formation. And the homogeneously formed cirrus tend to be vastly thicker because there's just so many small uh, solution droplets already in the atmosphere. So in this case, we get a, the opposite of cooling. Um, you can still hear me, right? Good. Great. Um, so now for mixed phase, that was for cirrus. For mixed phase, uh, once you add INPs, you get the heterogeneous droplet freezing, uh, which, which is usually thought to be um, INPs immersed in a water droplet that then freezes. And here we don't have to worry about the homogeneous freezing. Um, but there's another process that's critical here which is the WBF or Bergeron process. In this, ice crystals grow um, by depleting surrounding, uh, surrounding cloud droplets, resulting in uh, essentially a thinner cloud that precipitates out quicker. Um, here you can see it, it happening in this picture where you have this giant um, crystal relative to the droplet size of what's surrounding. And these are basically ev continuously evaporating. And then that mass is depositing onto the ice crystal structure. So once you get INPs in, in mixed phase clouds, if there's very few, then you'll just deplete the droplets. Um, and that mass will generate very large ice crystals that deplete quickly. If you have more INPs, then you might you can generate a stable ice cloud that stays for longer. And adding INPs can adding INPs on top of what's already available can lead you toward either of these states, more stable um, or less. So that makes understanding this quite tricky. Um, so do the IMP changes warm or cool? Even if we know which direction it's going, we still need to know whether these mixed phase clouds are initially warming or cooling, hence whether uh, increasing the radiative effects will, will increase the warming, the initial state. Um, but it mixed phase temperatures, clouds can be either warming or cooling, so that complicates things here. So now I'll be presenting the more central parts of my thesis research. There were two studies here that I combined together. One is uh, focused on 
large globally uniform changes in desert dust. And the other is, is focused on the role of anthropogenic black carbon from soot. And these are the two studies here. Um, so mineral dust concentrations, we know they've changed in the past, in the paleo record at diverse time scales, such as interglacial, um, but also over the last century, it's, it's thought that it's actually doubled globally, uh, the mineral dust concentrations. Future dust concentrations are very hard to predict, um, partly because it's so sensitive to, uh, the emission is sensitive to wind and to moisture. And then there's also some anthropogenic activity that's releasing dust. Um, so for the experiments I'll show you, we just made very large changes. Um, we ran different setups uh, with present day dust, one tenth that and 10 thirds that uniformly distributed. And then for black carbon, we know that anthropogenic emissions are expected to decline uh, nearly all scenarios, uh, the RCP and the SSP um, anticipate this. Um, so we he, here we just study the role of all anthropogenic black carbon, and this is we we expect this will be due to pollution control measures. So we're of course very interested um, whether aerosol changes will uh, cause warming that uh, reinforces greenhouse gas warming, or, or or whether it will offset it with cooling. Um, well, we know overall that th there's a cooling, but we need to understand, uh, to understand the whole picture, we need to understand the IMP forcings, and then dust and black carbon are the most uh, established IMPs. So that's what we study here. So we ran different simulations um, that had diverse IMP amounts, and then we ran sensitivity tests that bounded um, uh, the forcings we, we came up with. Um, and then we tried to understand a bit more. I'll show some slides on this. Um, particularly, I ran CESM. This was a mix of CESM one and two. One study used one, the other study used two. You can still hear me, right? Yes. Great, thanks. Um, and a lot of the work I did in my thesis was adjusting the Morris and Gettleman scheme, which I know has recently been put into the GIS model for the next version. Um, so I was adjusting this to put in new functions for ice nucleation that come from the laboratory rather than the older ones um, that were less backed in observations that were already in the model. Um, such as this one, which is from an Ulrich paper, where you have the temperature, uh, of the clouds and then uh, an efficiency to generate new ice crystals. And this is a function, so this is a function of the temperature and saturation. Um, so, and then we did a lot of validation with satellites, Logic Calypso, um, sorry, Calliope, um, Cloud Phase, uh, which is relatively recent um, to be used. Um, and then ice number, which is very new, um, and of course radiative effects. And these experiments, because we're just calculating the forcing, which is standard for indirect effect studies, um, sea surface temperatures were kept fixed. This also allowed us to do relatively short simulations and hence do a lot of simulations, um, which the sensitivity test necessitated. Um, so I'm gonna present a mix of the dust and black carbon study results. Um, increasing dust, which is going from the black line to the red line here, we find that ice number uh, for the mixed phase cloud temperatures increases, but then for the cirrus clouds decreases. So, so we get this interesting contrast between these different types of clouds. Um, and then other uh, properties are affected too, but I won't show you the glaciation and cloud occurrence um, from from these changes to the IMPs, to the dust IMPs in this case. 
So here I'll just show you the increase in DOS, which is an extremely large increase, just taking present day and increasing at 230%, ten, about 10 thirds the value. Um, we found that this enhanced the shortwave negative forcing, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, where most of the dust sources are located. Um, and then it also enhanced the long wave warming effect. But when we put these together, the net effect was, it was very weak, much weaker than we would have expected for such a large change of the IMPs uh, to the mixed phase clouds. So we, we expect that this is making the mixed phase, that adding IMPs is making the mixed phase clouds more stable and more radiatively uh, impactful. So this route but very weak forcings. And I didn't show you, but we see the same for the INP forcings. Um, and this is probably because uh, the, of, of the laboratory experiments. We use recent laboratory, uh, recent laboratory uh, fittings for black carbon, ice nucleating potential shows it to be much weaker than previously thought before, including the ones we put in to the model. Um, And for, for Cirrus, the increase in dust uh, decreases ice number. But when we look at a global, so this is on global average, but when we look on the maps, you actually see a more complicated picture where uh, this is looking for the radiative properties. Um, you wind up thinning and uh, decreasing um, the short wave and long wave radiative effects on most of the globe because you're predominantly decreasing the homogeneous nucleation uh, ability there. But then close to the main dust sources, right around the Sahara, for instance, you, you wind up, uh, or at least our simulation showed that Cirrus became thicker and more uh, radiatively impactful in both short wave and long wave. And this is probably because uh, the homogeneous nucleation was first depleted or already was in the base state present day. And now you're just continuing to add IMPs that enable homogeneous nucleation. But then when we combine the short wave and long wave, we find relatively weak sim signals that are still more long wave dominant. But when you average that globally, you get an extremely weak signal, right? Because there's contrast between near and far from the major dust sources. So we find, at least for the dust, um, that both the mixed phase and cirrus, giant changes to dust um, at the site of present deserts um, cause very limited net radiative effects and hence are expected to cause very little warming or cooling, which was quite a surprise to us. So we saw both of these routes to, to, re, to reshow this diagram I showed later, both warming and cooling, but just very weak signal globally, despite all these changes to the cloud um, optical radiative properties. So we wanted to understand, we, we thought at least the Cirrus was more interesting here um, because we're getting uh, at least some big regional effects with the dust. So we want to understand this. And then I still haven't actually mentioned um, the serious effects of the black carbon. So we tried to understand this by looking at maps of long wave and short wave serious effects. Starting, and we did, we, we did a bunch of simulations for very different INP states, um, starting with no INPs in the atmosphere at all. Um, you can still hear me, right? Yep. Great. Um, so this isn't a realistic scenario, of course, but this was something to learn from. So starting from the zero INP case, we then add dust, first a tenth present day amount, then, then present day amount. And what's interesting is you see um, that first you're moving toward a negative forcing, which I, I've magnified this here. Um, you're moving toward a negative forcing, which is in this direction the lower left. Um, but then as you add more INPs to the same location, more dust INPs to the same deserts, uh, 
you don't get cooling anymore. And ultimately, we'd expect you get an actual warming. Um, so we tried to understand what's going on here. And what we think is going on is that because the cirrus are more uh, long wave, um, they have more of an influence on long wave radiation that let's say we're, we're adding INPs um, and, and, and there's just, and, and th that's thickening um, the cirrus in both the short wave and the long wave will have more of a long wave effect. So on this diagram, we'll have this sort of steep slope. Um, but, this, but for when we're um, thinning the thick homogeneously formed cirrus, they, and both of these are happening together at different times, different points, um, we get a different slope because thick cirrus tend to be at or near long wave saturation. So when we first add INP, the atmosphere just has homogeneously formed cirrus. So you get this sort of uh, slope that, that generates some cooling in this diagram. But then as you add more, then you get this changing dominance where the heterogeneous, the increase in heterogeneous nucleation takes over from the decrease in homogeneous nucleation, and you get this, uh, this counterclockwise motion here. So then we added black carbon INPs, and we find that rather than adding more dust, unlike if we added more dust, we actually get cooling again, so, or, or negative forcing. So first we added natural black carbon, and then anthropogenic. Um, and the reason that this happens, uh, we expect, is because the black carbon have different sources than the dust that's already in the atmosphere. So it's reaching clouds that still have plenty of homogeneous, um, homogeneously, ho homogeneously formed ice crystals that can be depleted by the INPs um, reducing the saturations present. And interestingly enough, if we add uh, the black carbon instead to an atmosphere that has less dust INPs, but still some, um, let's say, for example, if, if the model was not correct, if it had too many dust INPs, which is very uncertain, um, then we'd actually have a stronger um, impact, um, a stronger uh, weak, so, sorry, a, a, sorry, a stronger negative forcing and expected cooling from the black carbon. And then we added much more black carbon 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, 10,000 times, not really realistic values. And we found it took a lot to get substantial warming. So we think that any warming from black carbon or IMP shifts, it seems, strong, it seems unlikely to be strong. And same with the cooling, because you're always ultimately reaching this clockwise motion. We think a strong cooling from INP changes is also unlikely. Um, so, so for the black carbon, we actually found a moderate cooling, um, significantly more than anything we found with the dust changes. So we found minus 0.13 watts per meter square uh, effective rate of forcing. We did a lot of sensitivity tests. I show here where the blue is the short wave, red's the long wave, green's the net forcings for all the different tests. Um, the controls, the main one, which I just cited. But then we, we changed updrafts, which are extremely uncertain in models. We have very low confidence in those being right. Um, number of sulfate, which competes with the INPs, right? Uh, aging, which impacts the INP uh, efficiency. That's something we coded into our modified version of the model. Um, and we found a, a, a range that was still predominantly on the cooling side. And this is a bit different than the current consensus in the literature or the relatively recent one, or, or I mean, this, this 2013 paper is still, I think, quite authoritative, um, where they say that um, anthropogenic INPs, uh, black carbon INPs, uh, could cause stronger 
uh, forcings either negative or positive in cirrus clouds and are expected to have um, significant positive forcing through mixed phase indirect, which we found to be totally negligible, probably because we use these more recent uh, laboratory measurements, um, that laboratory parameterizations. So perhaps compared to the understanding, the scientific understanding, maybe this will reduce the benefits of black carbon um, by reducing the cooling forcing, causing a bit of warming that counteracts the other factors. And then for mineral dust, we found only very limited forcing, despite making very large changes. Um, and we did sensitivity experiments there too, but they also didn't come with anything particularly strong. So I'm going to wrap up. That, that's the central part of my thesis work on yeah, being on the natural and anthropogenic uh, IMP effect. Now I'll talk about geoengineering a bit, particularly uh, cirrus cloud seeding, where you add through drones or however you add um, aerosols acting as INPs to homogeneously form cirrus and through that deplete their warming effect, um, causing cooling that would uh, hopefully counteract some of greenhouse gas induced warming. Um, there are other uh, geoengineering strategies involving aerosols, such as adding them to enhance the cooling of low marine clouds and adding them to the stratosphere to resemble volcanic cooling. Um, and then there are some non, uh, so some non aerosol uh, strategies as well, uh, planting trees, base mirrors, um, so what we did in this study, which I should say was led by our collaborator, Blodge Gasparini at the University of Washington, um, is I, I ran some CES simulations and he ran some simulations with ECHM, um, so two different climate models, and we tried to get as much of an impact of uh, causing serious uh, ca causing cooling by adding INPs to Cirrus. Um, so we essentially set up the simulations to represent uh, a maximal seeding scenario where we added the INPs everywhere um, to fit this kind of Goldilocks, as this study found it, um, where you're not adding too much, too many to have heterogeneous um, INPs thickening the Cirrus and increasing the positive uh, radiative effects, and you're not having too few to have an impact. And then we assess the ability, or, or really a colleague did, assess the ability um, for this seeding to counteract uh, 50, plus 50% 50 carbon dioxide from pre-industrial levels, which is similar to where we are. So I'm just going to show you for the start um, the, and for most of these, the effects from the CSM simulations. So here on the left is the serious net radiative if effect initially. And then on the right is the, um, the percent reduction by adding the INPs in this maximal scenario. Um, I should say that the serious net radiative effect is quite uncertain. Um, one study from a few years ago said it was somewhere like two to nine watt per meter square. So there's a lot of uncertainties in understanding serious net radiative effects and the impacts of, um, of changing them, but we are comfortably in that range. Um, and then uh, you see you get, through the scenario we managed to remove 27% of, of the positive serious net radiative effect overall, um, which happened very uh, non-uniformly from region to region, right? We have the strongest in the Southern Hemisphere, extratropics, which are relatively pristine of INPs, 
Um, so there were a lot of homogeneously formed cirrus to deplete there. But then near the major natural ion piece sources um, and, and anthropogenic, right, um, you actually get overseeding where you wind up making cirrus have a stronger positive effect, but just not enough with this uh, scenario to, to, to dominate. Um, you can still hear me, right? Yes. Um, so then we, we uh, looked at the, uh, the temperature effect of the cirrus seeding on the right versus the temperature change from the plus 50% CO2 on the left. And we found that the seeding here for CSM reduced 65% of the warming. It was a bit less for Ekham, which I'm not showing. And, and like with the serious effects, this was stronger for the Southern Hemisphere. Um, our colleague actually also looked at the uh, changes to precipitation. So generally the seeding decreased precipitation, um, which makes some sense because of the opposite temperature effects. But then another interesting thing we saw was that both the uh, both, both from the, the change, the increase in carbon dioxide and from the, the cirrus seeding, they both induced a northward shift of the intertropical convergence zone, which makes sense here because it follows the warmer hemisphere. Um, and, and the change was uh, comparable with these. So then our colleague tried to un to estimate what the effects would be uh, of of the um the ability for the cirrus seeding to counteract the damage due to the co2 um and he used a climate damage function involving temperature changes and precipitation ch changes relative to interannual variability um that comes from uh, climate economic modelers. And which is of course, uh, not, not the most advanced concept here, right? Once you add people, economies, um, it becomes very hard to get a concrete function, um, but this is what was available. So on the left is the damage with just the plus 50% CO2 and here I show both CSM and ECM on the bottom, and on the right, the damage with CO2 and the seeding. And CSM, this was able to reduce uh, the large majority of the climate damage, and with ECM, half of it. So that's, uh, and, and I should say that the temperature was really the dominant. Um, by this function, temperature really set the climate damage function rather than precipitation. So this looks good for the, the cloud seeding geoengineering strategy um, that it was in our simulations able to strongly offset the climate damage. Um, but of course, in the simulations, it's just pressing a few, changing a few parameters around. Um, whereas we haven't, we still have and, and nobody really has any, has very much idea how this would look in the real world. Um, a massive global operation that would probably be much more expensive than uh, reducing greenhouse gases now, right? Um, so overall, for everything I showed you, um, the summary, um, natural and anthropogenic IMP changes were found to have very limited um, in some ways, but not always in significant global radiative impacts. We saw, I showed you cancellations between shortwave and longwave radiation um, from region to region, and then cancellations between impacts on, in mixed phase versus serious clouds. Um, but maybe more, more targeted INP changes um, could, could, uh, could have a stronger potential to alter Earth's radiative balance, and maybe this could be harnessed, though it's still far too early to really know this. Um, and just as a last slide, I wanted to just 
put up a bit what I'm working on now. Um, so primarily I came here to, or, or now I guess, um, to do stratospheric and volcanic aerosol research. We want to uh, do, I want to do some develop, I'm going to do some development tasks uh, with Matrix to try and get volcanic and stratospheric aerosols uh, more realistic and then do some scientific studies uh, with more interactive model versions. Um, and then also with Lorenzo, I w we want to uh, unify his interest in circulation with mine in, in clouds and cloud feedbacks and see the impact of cloud feedbacks on circulation changes, including the southern hemisphere jet stream. Um, and thank you. Thank you all for coming here on this beautiful day. Great. Thank you, Zach, Zachary. Thank you very much. That was a really nice talk. Um, it was a really nice overview of your work. Um, just looking in the chat right now, I can't see any questions, um, but I'll remind people that if you have questions, uh, please indicate in the chat um, that you have one and then either you can write the question or you can unmute yourself. So I, I guess, um, you know, okay, actually we do have one right now. Um, so I'm going to unmute you. Actually, you should be you should unmute yourself. Please, please feel free to JSEC, Please feel free to to ask your question. Sure, thank you, Zach. It was a very nice talk. I was wondering about one thing. Uh, when you're considering a heterogeneous nucleation with uh, black carbon particles, yeah, what is at least known for? Uh, when black carbons become coated with uh, a liquid, um, you get an enhancement of uh, absorption by black carbon because the, the coat around the black carbon particle acts something like a, a lens. It focuses more light on the absorbing core, which is absorbing. And I think that the effect can be between 10 and even 30%. So that would counter a little bit what you have seen uh, if you are not taking that into account. Uh, the cooling effect of, uh, you know, black carbon in at least um, uh, water droplets. I don't know how big that effect would be in uh, crystals. Um, but I was wondering, um, have you thought about that? Did you take that into account? And if not, um, might there be a possibility to take that into account? Uh, yeah, well, this sounds more like direct effects of black carbon uh, and maybe semi-direct effects would be affected. Um, whereas I focused just on the impacts on microphysical ice formation. Uh, yes, but what you're seeing is, you know, uh, uh, well, I guess maybe it's a you know, case of terminology, um, but what you are seeing is that the radiative effect becomes larger because a black carbon particle becomes coated in a droplet, and likely also in, in a crystal. So I'm not sure how you would term it, but anyway, I think that it would have an impact and uh, Maybe that's an interesting topic for future. Yeah, so um, I did consider the aging of black carbon, and I coded that into the model that once it gets um, a certain amount of sulfate on it, then it's considered aged and uh, acts less as an INP and more as a droplet um, that can only freeze at homogeneous temperatures. Um, so, sorry, they can only freeze homogeneously around minus 38. Um, so, uh, essentially, its INP effect is deactivated uh, when it's coated so much that you no longer get the properties of the, uh, the surface um, that enable the ice formation to occur at, at low um, saturations or, 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 or higher temperatures. Um, but um, even this is not really fully known because other groups, there was one lab group that found that as black carbon is reused, 
in the atmosphere as freezing happens and then the black carbon gets released um the initial event restructures the the um the black carbon into being more effective so so just with the imp effect we have very little understanding um whether the aging will increase its efficiency to generate new ice crystals by orders of magnitude or decrease it by orders of magnitude. Um, so this is still a big unknown. Great, thanks. Um, so next we have uh, a question from Anne. Um, Anne, I'll just read it out loud unless you'd like to, to ask it. So Anne says, uh, well, uh, actually, I would like to ask it because I just want to say welcome back, Zach. <laughs> and also, I'm really looking forward to this development work that you described on our Cirrus because um, I think that's kind of something from my perspective we've thought about the least. And my question, now, ECOM, they have a scheme for gravity waves in Cirrus formation, don't they, in, in, their, mm. in their model? In, in CSM, you mean? I was thinking actually ECOM. ECOM. Oh, I'm I'm not sure about this. Oh, there was. Oh. Yeah, so I'm concerned about this because we don't have a gravity wave scheme, and a, and I'm we're aiming to get one. We'd like to get one because we think you know we know that the vertical motions are so important to cirrus formation. Uh, so anyway, just a comment, and I look forward to working with you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I saw Joyce Penner's group had an article about an advanced um updraft scheme but i think that must have also been the csm okay uh, interesting I'm not sure about that. thanks thanks ann uh so the next question is um is from daniel daniel would you like to unmute yourself and ask well, that's quite all right you can read it okay okay um okay so the question is uh, do you model the impacts of rocket launches on the aerosols in the upper atmosphere or is that just such a small effect that it's not uh, worth it uh, so what about commercial aviation impacts to the upper troposphere and stratosphere are any assumptions made about growth or non-growth in aerosols um so for the black carbon we did um, we only actually put that in one sensitivity test as a sensitivity test to add in um, aviation black carbon. Um, and we found very little effect there. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. I know that uh, there's some grand plans to settle Mars in the near future. So I don't know um, if you've given any thought to what those impacts might be. I don't would expect Elon Musk would have really looked at it. Yeah, this is something I haven't thought about yet. But we can talk. Yeah. Great. Um, so Ron had the next question. Ron, do you want to ask that? Um, sure. Um, yeah. Well, first, again, um, uh, welcome back. Uh, it's, it's good to see you. Um, I, I, so it seems like you know, one of the key results is you're getting this really large cancellation between short wave and long wave effects. And, um, but you're also pointing out that um, a lot of the, um, the physics in these parameterizations um, is either uncertain or it relies on parameters that are not well known. So I'm just wanna, I just wanna know like how, um, is the door really closed on, on, on significant effects of dust, for example, or are there, combinations of parameters that you know where you you don't see this this uh strong offset between long wave and short wave uh it's definitely not closed um i guess i in retrospect i realized we we made quite distinct sensitivity tests where we changed parameters by like an order of magnitude or so in many cases but in retrospect i realized this isn't really nearly enough um but i expect some of the same uh, factors to influence and limit um, the rate of effects. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's a lot more work to be done. Another thing is that the experimental design 
was maybe not really uh, realistic, right? Because I uniformly just multiplied the dust, for example, at the same sources um, by, by a given factor. Um, maybe there'd be opening expansion of deserts that might reach uh, different clouds that could make more of an imbalance between the long wave and short wave, because it's really about what what those what that dust it, what sort of clouds that dust is hitting and how much how many INPs in this case are already there. So there there definitely would be ways uh, for a different scenario to to make a greater contrast between the long wave and short wave effect. But we just couldn't look at all of this. Okay, thanks. Great, thanks. So I, I can't see any more questions in the chat. Um, but I just had one quick question. It I think it mainly reflects my lack of understanding of uh, these kinds of uh, problems in this research area. But um, but I had a question about it was the slide. It was uh, it was looking at the INP forcings on Cirrus, and it was essentially just maps of the radiative forcing, short wave and long wave. Um, and there was some kind of interesting structure there, and this is probably something that's well known, um, but I was just wa This one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I'm just curious, so that kind of dipole behavior that you see there, is that is that kind of a dynamical thing? Do you, do you understand why it, it looks that way? I would say it's more microphysical because um, away from the dust source, uh, where you don't have so many IMPs, what IMPs you're adding are just are mostly reducing the ability to have homogeneously formed ice crystals, and then near the dust sources, you're having so many that you don't have so much um, so many homogeneously formed crystals to begin with. You mostly have heterogeneously formed crystals, and those you're adding to. So it's really just the effects of, of what's going on microphysically that you're seeing on a much larger scale. Great, thanks uh, for clarifying. Um, and then I guess kind of a related question, because I'm trying to go back to dynamics. Um, you've shown kind of the radiative impacts. Have you looked at kind of Hadley cell shifts or kind of circulation uh, responses in, in these experiments? Um, no, that was actually kept out as a factor. Um, so we actually nudged the winds here so that the simulations could only be a few years because I ran many of them both to do the sensitivity tests and to isolate the different um, the different types of forcings um, to separate out the IMP effects, both in Cirrus and mixed phase separately. Um, so yeah, we would have had to have done the simulations with a more interactive uh, world, right? Where, where the winds were free to interact and probably with an ocean model too. Only in the geoengineering experiment was there, there was there, there was a mix layer ocean and there you saw some dynamical response like with that ipcc shift great yep thanks nice um so i want to thank you again uh, zachary this was a really really nice um presentation of the of uh the various projects you've been working on um and you know i, I join everyone else in saying it's really really nice seeing you and uh hopefully we can all uh kind of meet in person again uh soon so uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, coming to the seminar. Um, thank you very much. And uh, a, this was being recorded and we'll post the, uh, the recording uh, within about a week or two. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, I'll see you at the next uh, seminar. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Zachary.